Hey everyone, it's Anthony from Pretty Printed here. In today's video, I'm going to introduce you to the Flask Rust Plus extension. So this is going to be the first video in a series of videos that are based on Flask Rust Plus. And the reason why I'm covering it is because it's a pretty good extension for building an API. So it's not just a way to organize the code that goes into an API, but it's also a way to kind of make things that come with APIs a lot easier to deal with. And you'll see as I make this example and the future examples in other videos, how things can be a little easier. But in this video, I'm going to start simple. And then as I go on through the videos, it's going to get a little more complicated. So right now I'm starting with an empty file. So the first thing I need to do is actually install Flask Rust Plus. And by the way, Flask Rust Plus is a fork of Flask Restful. So they have some of the same features, but Flask Rust Plus adds so much more on top of it. So if you're going to choose between the two, I'd say choose Flask Rust Plus. So Flask dash Rust Plus. I should already have it installed, so it won't install, but that's all you need to do to install it. Once it is installed, then I'm going to do the typical Flask import. So from Flask, import Flask. And then from Flask underscore Rust Plus, I'll start by importing API. Okay, so I'll instantiate the Flask app now. And then I will instantiate API. So of course this can use the application factory pattern by calling a knit app on API after you instantiate an API without the app. But for this purpose, I'm gonna keep it as simple as possible so this will all be in one file. Okay, so now that I have the API, let me put the if name block, so if name is main, and then I will run the app in debug mode. Okay, so when you're building an API in Flask REST Plus, you have to follow the convention of Flask REST Plus. So you can't just create random routes that represent your API. Instead, things are going to be kind of organized a little better, which is good for your code as it grows. Uh, because it'd be a lot easier to modify if things are grouped together logically. If you had a bunch of routes that could go anywhere, then it can be a little hard to modify once you have a lot of routes. So the first thing that needs to be done is I need to specify a route for the API. So just imagine my URL and then slash something. So my root URL, my base URL is just the index, and that's actually going to become important in just a moment. But I'm going to start with the first route and I'll just create one route in this video and I'm going to call this route language. So app route slash language. So API dot route slash language. So that's pretty familiar. That's what we do in Flask everywhere, unless you're using a different way of um, organizing your routes, but that should be somewhat familiar to you. I mean, I, I hope it is if you're watching this video, but instead of putting a function here instead, what we're going to do is we're going to put a class. So I'm going to call this class language and it's going to inherit from resource. So I need to import resource from Flask REST Plus. And that's going to, of course, inject all the features of Flask REST Plus into this class. So now, remember an API, a RESTful API, you have the different methods that you're interested in. So get, post, put, delete, and of course you can use other metho methods if you choose to do so. Uh, Git and post are the ones I'll be covering in this videos, but just know that the put and delete, and there's also one more that I can't think of. Oh, patch. Those three, they're analogous to the two that I'll show you in this video, so just keep that in mind, even though I won't be showing them. If you can figure out Git and post, then figuring out the others are pretty straightforward. So now what I want to do is I want to define a gets on this language route. So imagine I'll go to my URL slash language and that will be a git request if I went in my browser or I sent a git request from a tool like curl or postman. So to handle the git request on language, I'm going to create a method called git. And of course it's going to have self as a parameter. And what I'm going to do is I'm simply going to return hey and there. So the reason why I'm doing this is so you can see how much happens even though this code is fairly simple. So for one, unlike Flask or regular Flask, you don't have to use JSONify here because Flask Rust Plus assumes that you're returning JSON data. So you can just return Python data types, a combination of dictionaries and lists, and it will automatically generate JSON for you. 
So if I save this and I start my app, so let's see, Python app. So remember, I have this language route here, so that's what I'm going to go to. Slash language. I'll go to it, and it's telling me it's unable to connect, and I think it's because I spelled language wrong. Let me just make sure. Language. Yeah, the name is correct. So let me just make sure I'm in the right spot. Oh, the reason why it's not working is because I don't have the port. So port 5000 slash language. Okay, let's try that again. So port, port 5000 slash language because my app is running on port 5000, of course. And it's a little slow. My computer is not cooperating. So let me go ahead and restart the app and I'll go to language again. Okay, so if I look at the raw data here, I see a simple JSON object, hey there. Okay, so that's pretty simple, not very interesting, but look at this. If I go to my index, I have this page here, even though I didn't specify anything in my code for this page. And what this is, is actually Swagger documentation. So if you're not familiar with Swagger, it's just a way to both document what an API is supposed to uh, expect and return and it also gives you a way of testing that API from the browser so if I click on this default namespace which is what I'm working in I see I have a git and then slash language here and if I click on that it has this information about the endpoint which is not very descriptive because I didn't add anything extra but it has this button here to try it out so if I click try it out it performs a request for me and then it shows me the response. So the response is, hey, there, which is pretty cool because it makes it a lot easier to test your API. So this is going to come into play when I have a post request that I want to work with. So before I get to the post request, what I'll do is I'll create uh, a list of languages just as a demonstration on, you know, uh, returning actual data. So languages will start off empty and then I'll create, let's say Python. And the data is going to look like this. And then I'll simply append that to the languages list. So now instead of returning, Hey there, I'm going to return languages and this should be languages. There we go. So my app crashed because I didn't add that S. So now what I'll do is I'll, go back to the root, click default, and then I will try again on getting the languages. And you see here the response body, if I zoom in a little bit, you see it's a list with Python as the language. So like I said, as long as you're using Python dictionaries and Python lists, they can easily be converted to JSON and then the response can be shown there. So if I wanted to do something like add a post request. So what I want to do is I want to allow the user to specify new languages and then they get appended to that list that I have. The first thing I need to do is kind of define what a list or what a language looks like. So by defining what a language looks like, Flask Rust Plus can then tell Swagger what a language looks like and it will be in the documentation and the user of your API will know what to expect. So to do that up here, uh, below API because I'll be using API. I'm going to use something called API.model. So I will call this a underscore language, probably not the best name, but I'll go with that. So a underscore language, and then I'm going to call API.model. And then I'll give it an actual name. So the name of this model is language. And then I'm going to give it what constitutes a language. So in this case, it is just the key language. And then the value of language is a string. So I need to import fields. And then I'll describe what a language is supposed to be. So fields.string describes what I'm expecting. And then I can give it a human readable description. So the language. Okay. So because I'm using the word language so often, this can be a little confusing. But you'll see how it works once I get it up and running. So this API model now knows what it means to be a language. It's not just something 
uh, in my code that can mean anything. Now, when the user goes to Swagger, they will see that I am expecting a language and they're going to see that because on this post request, so remember, just like Git, I just do post. I can put a decorator up here at API and then like I have a route before for the language, the decorator here is going to be expect. And what this is going to expect is a language. So this a language here is a definition of the API model. And then inside of the post method, what I can do is I can take whatever is passed into the post. So I'm going to send data with the post request. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to append it to the languages list. So to get the data, there are many ways of getting the data, but the one that I'm going to show you in this video is just by using API.payload. So if I do API.payload, that is actually the JSON object that is sent over in the request. So I can simply append that to languages. So languages dot append API payload. And I'll return, let's say results language added. And like regular class, you can pass in an HTTP status. So in this case, I'll do 201 for uh, something has been created. So now let's see what happens when I run this. Uh, my app didn't crash. So I will go back to the root, click default again. And now I see both Git and post. So when I click post on the right hand side here, it gives me what is this it's expecting. So it's expecting a language and then a value called language. And if I click on it, it adds it automatically into the payload. So what I'll do is I will change this and my language will be JavaScript. So if I hit try it out, it sends that I see the result here is language added. And then if I go to my Git route and then try this out, I now have two languages in the response because that language is list in my code has been appended to. So if I run this again and I use, let's say C++ instead of JavaScript, try it out again, I get the same result. It looks the same because nothing changes there. But if I try this out, then I see C++ here. So you can see how much easier it is to test out your API by using Swagger. And if someone was using your API, it'd be very easy for them to determine what your API is expecting. So of course these other values can be filled in like the description. I just left those blank, but as you can see, the more you do, the easier it is for other people to understand what you're doing. And you don't have to exactly write the documentation yourself because it can be a little annoying. I mean, you may have to write some custom things, but it won't be nearly as much as if you were writing everything from scratch. So I'll just add one more language. Let's say, I don't want to do Java. Let's say Scala. So try it out, try it out. And then I see Scala in the list here of languages that are returned by the Git request. So pretty cool stuff. And this just demonstrates how Flask Rust Plus is so powerful when it comes to building APIs. I mean, if you're familiar with other frameworks, they have something similar to this, but for Flask, I think this is the only one that works in this way. And it's really cool if you are interested in building an API. So this is the first video, like I said, and I will have other videos on Flask Rust Plus so you can learn how to do more in the extension. And of course I have the courses on my site. So if you want to learn how to deal with other extensions, I have a bunch in the Flask extensions course. You can check this out on prettyprinted.com. I have Flask admin, Flask migrate, Flask babble, Flask socket IO, a bunch of extensions that are pretty useful in the course. I don't have Flask Rust Plus because I'll be covering it on YouTube. I didn't want to cover it in both, but hey, if anybody really wants it in the course, then I'll consider adding it. And of course I have the other courses there too. So check out prettyprinted.com. So that's it for this video. If you like this video, please give me a thumbs up. If you have subscribed already, please subscribe and then click the little notification bell next to the subscribe button so you can get all my new videos. I'll be adding more videos in the future. And if you have any comments, just leave them in the comment section below. So thank you for watching this video and I will talk to you next time.